Hello everybody, we're here with Professor Grant Schofield. I had the pleasure of meeting Grant at Snow Vision last year um, and managed to catch up with him again earlier in the year and write an article for My Vision magazine, which is an optometry magazine in Australasia. Um, and Grant's known as the Fat Professor, although you wouldn't, you wouldn't think so looking at the man. Um, how are you today, Grant? It's great. Thank you so much for coming on board. Oh, thanks for having me, uh, Ryan. It's a pleasure once again to uh, catch up with you. No, it's great. Um, you said you've eaten already. What was on the menu tonight in the Schofield House? Um, it was actually a low carb pizza. Yeah. So sort of cauliflower basey thing, and then just some bit of meat and cheese and veggies and that stacked on top. So, yeah, that's all gone down. So, it's been great. Easy peasy. Yeah. Uh, who is Grant Schofield today, mate? Uh, well, I'm a professor at a university so if everyone's got a, if you're a professor you're a professor of something yeah um, so my field is public health um which is a sort of accidental field so i do that half of the time we'll talk about that in a second the other at the moment i'm half my job is i'm the chief advisor for health and nutrition for new zealand's ministry of education um which we can talk about as well absolutely um so if we get started with the Ministry of Health. Um, last time I opened a sort of a nutrition, uh, I guess, flyer, it had a picture of a triangle and then I opened another one and it was a picture of a heart. Yeah. Uh, how does that fit in with your sort of field of, of the fat professor? Yeah, I've been, well, uh, I guess it's no secret, I've been battling away against conventional wisdom with nutrition, which is, you know, really just the, as you say, the food pyramid and the, um, high carbohydrate grainy base um, which they you know people say has changed but in fact it's not you know there's still the recommendations are to eat low fat and um, those sorts of things uh, so I don't I'm actually working for the Ministry of Health I'm working for the Ministry of Education which oh, is sorry, the, yep. the kids side of things uh, yeah I've been you know like this you, you do what you can and I'm just you know trying to move things along I think you know, probably the main one for the on the kids side of the thing is just get rid of this whole low fat dairy thing. Um, you know, when in fact the, it's bizarre that we have evidence for kids eating low fat foods when we actually know they're probably harmful, uh, more incident of obesity, more incidence of diabetes when kids eat that sort of thing. So, you know, you're picking away at it. Um, I'm sort of a little bit more ambivalent. I came in there fully charging, we're going to tip this food pyramid upside down, and I'm still doing that. You know, frankly, the wheels of this. Gov of these governments work so slowly um that, that, that were the thing that's changed after everyone else has changed so actually i think you know really i think with um blogging podcasts the internet um your sort of citizen science public health stuff i think actually um that's where the wave's coming from and i'm still trying to support that as much as i can so you know i'm not saying give up on government and nutrition guidelines but you know the reality is um we're not relying on those for how we eat, for most of us, hopefully. It is it. So probably the avenue I'd like to take it here is um, <clears throat> with public health, you know, it falls on the shoulders of people when, like optometrists and nurses and, and your GP. Um, are we still in the place in New Zealand where a, a nutrition lecture for a, for a GP is about one, one in their whole course? Or, or is that something that you in the public health field work towards? Um, no, I think you did right. I think in reality, most health professionals, um, I can't speak for optometry, but um, I think in medicine, it's, you know, there's, there's very little education. Um, you know, I think most GPs, I was talking to a cardiologist even um, just the other day, and he said, you know, my total nutrition training was zero. Um, so, you know, there's very little. Um, and what you do get is sort of this conventional wisdom. And the problem with the conventional wisdom is this idea that, um, you know, fat causes a lot, you know, fat, dietary fat, you know, therefore causing fat in the blood and then that fat in the blood is sort of accumulating in blood vessels around um, the body is the root cause of all these metabolic diseases, diabetes and um, uh, cardiovascular disease. You know, all the things that go wrong with your vascular system, you'll be familiar with all the retinopathies and all that sort of stuff. You know, it was a, we got the wrong thing. Um, and I would say that the, the root cause is just insulin, insulin resistance and glucose. And I think most of the science is now pretty much supporting that. It just takes a very long time for health professionals to change. Uh, 
and that's that's just a daily fight. I, I you know I went and did a lecture and uh, tore two lectures last week in Tauranga and um, the eastern northeastern part of New Zealand, which is a lovely place. Had 135 health professionals turn up. Um, you know, and there's there's many of them there. They've lost weight. They're in shape. They've sorted their diabetes out. You know, and so on and so on. Even so, the mere fact that I was t- turning up to talk to health professionals generated um, controversy. You can't have this guy talking to him, us. He's not supporting the nutrition guidelines. Um, you know, everyone should boycott it. You know, luckily, people didn't. But you know, that's the sort of stuff that goes on on a daily basis. <clears throat> um, and then you go into the public lecture in the afternoon. It's the same thing. It's you know, there's there's another hundred people. You know. Um, several of which, you know, oh, my life's changed. I've lost 35 kilos. I've lost 50 kilos. You know, it just goes on and on and on. And they haven't done it by listening to conventional wisdom. Absolutely. So um, you see Gary Feck, I think it is, from Tasmania, mm-hmm. being, you know, kicked out for sharing this sort of message around. And you see it quite dogmatic. And, and he often goes after the fact that carbohydrate might be, you know, sort of religious based with sanitarium and Kellogg's. <laughs> how, how do you see the, the dogma moving away from, from a carbohydrate base of a triangle? How, how do you see it? Do you think it's about sh- continually sharing the message or, or people continually telling their story? Yeah, I think that's right. There's, so um, Gary Fick is an orthopedic surgeon in Tasmania and he's, you know, going through the, you know, the ringer in Australia, um, there's, there's various dietitians. Uh, Jennifer Elliott's a high um, example in Australia who was, you know, really struck off the uh, low carbohydrate practice with diabetics, which is, you know, the, the more effective practice, of course. Um, Tim Noakes in South Africa, who's been high profile for, you know, for other low carbohydrate reasons. So, you know, it goes on. I think, um, you know, that's just going to continue. You know, medical bullying is nothing new. And we're sort of in part of the thing in nutrition is we think, oh, this is all new and it's terrible. Actually, this is this has just been what medicine uh, has done throughout the ages. Uh, you know, and just even obvious things that you know the fellow, you know, 150 years ago who figured out that you know if, if you did autopsies and then came and delivered babies straight away, that you know not washing hands was a problem and, and contributed to infant mortality. And he was, he was humiliated and bullied by his colleagues for, for you know, a decade before mm. they figured out that actually could, you could you know, save many lives every day. And this, it's just been, this has been absolutely the course of medicine. I'm not saying that's okay, but I'm saying this is this, you, you shouldn't expect anything differently. That this is the way they've operated. Um, we like some of the successes from modern medicine, but the behaviour of the people in it um, is basic humans. <laughs> don't, don't want to uh, change your mind, eh? <laughs> no, no, so, yeah. yeah. And so how, how did, working in a public health field, how did you come across this avenue? Oh, well, I'd done the conventional stuff because that's what I'd been told um, for a long time. And actually, um, you know, I'd like to say I was sort of, onto it and you know very smart and did that but frankly I, I spent the best part of 15 years doing the exact opposite of this um, not only that I got millions of dollars of taxpayer funding to do that work um, almost all of which is an abject failure so you know we'd tell people to exercise more because that would help them um, you know to, to um, cut down the calories and eat lower fat and blah 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 and you know it works for some people for some of the time but it's just not a solution that's that works um, and you would think after spending that much money um, and that much time fa- consistently failing, you would sort of get it. Um, <laughs> and frankly, I was led down the path by um, by Gary Torbs, the American journalist, yeah. Um, yeah, who wrote Good Calories, Bad Calories. I read that and I was like, you know, it was really, you know, really he wrote two PhD theses worth of work just for that book. You know, that's, that's a fairly um, dense sort of tome of, of nutrition stuff that opened my eyes and then his next book came out um, why we get fat and what to do about which is probably a more readable version and I think you know those two things you know really opened my eyes to what was going on I was just like you know so (laughs) yeah my profession didn't lead me to it that that book certainly did I I, I would say at the same time I had a few other things going on Um, one is work in the remote Pacific and and you'd just be in the the Southern Vanuatu is one of the nicest places in the world, by the way, mainly because people haven't, white people haven't gone there that much. 
Um, and so they're still living much the way they have. And what's immediately obvious is that they're not, you're walking around there with the World Health Organization guidelines thinking you're an expert on diabetes, um, telling these people how to get in shape. Um, and they're already in shape and they don't even think like that. Yeah. Um, and then you, go, then you go to some of these places where there's really no fat in the diet whatsoever. Um, you know, and, and more of the, um, um, the urban Pacific and then it's just terrible. Um, so that was going on. So it becomes obvious then that the guidelines weren't where it sat for optimal health. And then uh, I guess we were doing some, we did a lot of athlete, athlete testing in our own labs. Um, and one of the very interesting things, again, we'd been doing it for 15 years, um, just expired breath by breath gas analysis. And you look at people's um, fat and carbohydrate burning and why we hadn't looked at that parameter and um, when people are resting and as they exercise more is beyond me. And, and you see profound differences in people's ability to burn fat, um, despite very similar training, but it's very much diet driven. Uh, and, you know, of course, once you start going down this track, you just start the, the N equals one self experiment. You convince anyone, everyone else in your lab group and um, my research center to do, you know, have a crack at this. And all of a sudden, you know, we're making, little discoveries that hand over first and then you start researching it more and more and more and then you come across the other sort of leaders around the world um jeff wallach and steve finney in the states and tim Lakes in south africa and you go man this is just uh you know you're ashamed to be a professional research professor for you know a decade and a half doing exactly the wrong thing it's it's embarrassing yeah yeah um we had uh cliff harvey on here um, a couple, couple of episodes ago, and, and am, I, am I correct that you wrote uh, a preface for his carb appropriate diet? Is that yeah, right? so um, Cliff's written the carb appropriate diet, and he's also um, he's just completing his doctorate um, in my research um, centre under my supervision. So in Karen's in supervision. So and in fact, um, tomorrow is the f I think the four month follow up for a randomised trial we've just finished with um, that Cliff's been running where we randomized people to three different levels of carbohydrate restriction. And we're really interested in, you know, if we can predict from the baseline parameters who benefits the most from, you know, quite severe carbohydrate restriction to moderate just to, um, to the sort of upper end of what you call a low carb diet. So, yeah. Yeah. So no, Cliff's a good, the thing is with Cliff, of course, and I wrote this in as, um, this is another embarrassment. Um, I wrote this in as the forward for his book, is that we'd followed him since the um, mid-90s, and we just thought he was a complete lunatic. It's like, what is this going on about? You know, like, here, yeah, there's some wackos out there, Cliff Harvey, woohoo. Uh, turns out he was, you know, he, he, was, he was a decade ahead of us, a decade and a half. Um, and again, it's just, an, it's some, it, it just, you know, I was one of those bigots and bullies, and we were just like, oh, my God, these idiots. You, you know, I, I clearly remember giving a public talk where I, where I, um, you know, sort of said, watch out for these people, they're dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, it was me that was dangerous. There yeah. you go. <laughs> um, speaking of books, how did, how did the collaboration come together for What the Fat with, with you and Karen? Oh, you were, um, so Karen, I'd, Zin I'd known for a long time, so she was a public health dietitian and then she was a lecturer at uh, the Auckland University of Technology where I worked as well then she's in my research center I, back in the early 2000s i supervised her master's thesis and then her um doctoral thesis um in nutrition and then with sort of karen early on i was going karen this stuff's got to be wrong and she's like no 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 if fat's bad for you saturated fat that's you know but and then she started looking to it as well and we became quite close collaborators um and yeah we just keep we keep getting this message, people go to us, oh, well, look, it's all, even if you're right, the, the message that people are going to take from, you know, low, lower carb, higher fat is that they're going to just, um, you know, go to the takeaway shop and eat pizzas and uh, fish and chips and burgers and fries. And we're like, oh, just don't, that's, what I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. No. Um, and they're like, no, no, that's what people will do. I guarantee that's what they'll do. So we're like, okay, we'll write a, we'll just write a book about it. We'll put all the science in the back. Um, we'll get some beautiful recipes. 
um, some easy to do stuff and we'll put just an easy guide of what we think we're saying in the front so there's no confusion. So that was cool and hadn't quite expected it to take off as much as it has, but it's been um, really popular. And I'll tell you the other thing that um, is even cooler um, is the there's some, we, we just run a, and I get, there's plenty of these around the internet, but we've got our own one now, What the Fat um, Facebook community. People keep putting up staff either success stories and stuff, which is cool, but people will put up, you know, quite technical questions. And I sort of, by the time I get around to looking at it, going, I should answer that, or, you know, Karen's the same. You notice that the community itself is so um, onto it. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a dozen responses, all of which are better than what I would say anyway. <laughs> and, um, you know, well put with personal experience and, you know, references and the whole thing. So, you know, that sort of level of participant science, I, I just... It's just wonderful. Just, um, it's just astonishing that, that that's, you know, that's one of the great things about Facebook. Lots of, not so, you know, like get teenage kids off Facebook and they're happier. That's, that's a cool thing. But for, you know, these nutrition communities, it's really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so you've got a blog as well and you, and you go quite in depth into what you're talking about. Yeah. When you go and attack a blog piece, um, how do, how do you get started? Are you, are you sort of, you've got a, a pool of research there already that you call upon or? or um... Oh yeah. Yeah. We just sort of sit down and um, well, I don't even mean to ever write one. It just sort of comes out cause you get hot under the collar about something or <laughs> um, you know, there's just another something published. Um, so I'm just working on one at the moment. For example, there's some, you know, there's a, a sort of grain sponsored commission to come out and going, you know, whole grains are essential for health. There's, a, there's another one that's annoying me at the moment. The Ministry of Health has its, has put out its guide to diets and, you know, their claim is that you shouldn't eat low carb because it's, um, hasn't got grains. And if you don't have grains, you will be, you'll be nutrient deficient, you know, which is complete nonsense. So you, those sort of things just, you see these things popping up here and there and you just go, oh, I, I just feel I need to write something about this. The other thing about writing about stuff, of course, is that um, you know, mostly blogs are for my own benefit because um, at, at least you learn about the stuff. That you, you can read a paper and um, maybe this is a personal weakness, but you know, two days later, you, you don't remember anything about it. Um, whereas you have to force to sit down and write a blog about it, you know, type some stuff out verbatim, reinterpret some stuff, look more deeply at the analysis. At least you know what's going on. Um, yeah. And that's true of writing whole books as well, it, you know, times times a hundred. Is that you know part, the, the great part of the exercise is that at least you learn what's going on yourself. Great. And so, how do how do you learn to look at look at a piece of research and its evidence and, and how they're how they're interpreting the results? How do you what do you sort of do to to pick it in and and come to your own conclusion about is this right or maybe this is leading us away? Um. Yeah, just sort of read the abstract, get a feel for what's going on, um, quickly skim through the intro, have a good look at the methods, and then just um, go straight to the tables in the results section. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's so much. You, you, can, you, know, you can find whatever you want in research. And I think most people are probably familiar with the idea of um, relative risk, you know, in the sense of, well, you know, you were 36% more likely to get this than that, uh, you know, if you took this statin drug, for example, or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, the, uh, people, oh, we might have lost you. Their views and in a way, so it's, it's much easier to get to uh, to the original data and interpret it. You know, so you know, a, a, a thirty, you know, a third increase in the likelihood of something which is only a two percent incidence of to start with. Um, is only, you know, a, a, a very small increase in risk. And so, you know, I just, I, well, answer the question, um, how do I read research? I, I just look at the paper, yeah. gather stuff, usually go to the references from there, um, go from there. Lovely. Um, and so with, with the, the, the diabetes. How do you? How do you? If we can recap what we wrote in the article, how do you think the real cause of diabetes and the real cause of of um, cardiovascular disease happens with these sugar, oh, carbohydrate and fat in unison? How can, can you? I, well, I think it's pretty. 
um, I think it's pretty simple. So the, you know, the prevailing hypothesis um, up until World War II really was that sugar and starch were the main cause of metabolic problems. And by metabolic, you include all the sort of vascular problems from you know, uh, um, your coronary arteries clogging up to you know, stroke, which is you know, a, a, a clogged vessel in the brain through to you know, vascular disease and the rest of the body. So there's just damage to those. Um, all of those problems um, are predominantly, the, you know, the view was that sugar and starch were a cause of those um, without that much evidence. Um, and then, as I think most people know, then the sort of American science through the 60s and 70s and then possibly the 1980s was the diet heart hypothesis that uh, eating fat, um, especially saturated fat, um, caused higher fats in the blood. Um, and those fats in the blood directly caused um, damage to the blood vessels and clogging up of blood vessels. So that was sort of the clogged artery idea. Um, and, you know, really, I think that's a reasonable hypothesis. They sort of look the same fat. That's certainly spelt the same everywhere. Um, but it just doesn't turn out to be true because, um, you know, fats in your blood are primarily, at least the unhealthy ones, especially triglyceride, are primarily driven up by sugars. Um, and carbohydrates by insulin fluxing through the liver. Uh, and it's sugary blood um, and high insulin in of itself um, that cause damage to the blood vessels that cause any of the, all of the inflammation around the body and then uh, the, the vascular damage that follows that. Um, there might be fats at the scene, um, but they're there as a repair process. Um, and, you know, I'm not the first one to say this, but it's a bit like, you know, we see fats, um, lipids of various sorts, lipoproteins um, at the scene of inflammation in blood vessels. Um, and people say, well, that's about the same as blaming uh, firemen for, you know, for causing fires because they're attending it to help fix it up, which is what these lipids are doing. So, you know, like diabetes in itself is a disease of high blood sugar. Um, and I, and I keep saying this, I just think from first principles, if, just imagine you're a Martian coming from another planet and you go, okay, these humans have got this thing called diabetes where their sugars in their bloods are too high. Um, you know, the first question is, well, um, how do they get those sugars in the blood? Are oh, they getting them through eating? Do they need to eat them? Um, what would happen if they didn't eat them? Well, nothing. They'd be perfectly healthy. They'd just their blood sugar would be low. So you go, well, why do, we, why do we manage diabetes by allowing people to eat lots of sugars um, and then trying to get rid of them out of the system with drugs, either you know, pushing them into the cells, which is what metformin does, or you know, using a, other uh, means to try and dilute them out of the body. It's just, it's just nonsensical, our modern approach to diabetes, to try and allow people to eat lots of sugars when they don't need to eat them. Um, which really brings me on to our next point, which is this um, idea that dietary carbohydrate is a non-essential nutrient. You don't have to eat any of it, ever to maintain a normal healthy um, amount of glucose in your blood you can you can do that just fine and I, you know I think the most powerful way to illustrate that that I do with my students is you um, you ask people what's the longest time in the medical literature someone hasn't eaten food for <laughs> and they sort of look at you and you know you sort of wonder why students can't figure this out instantly they've got a you know a device right in front of them all of human knowledge um, but eventually someone googles it and says oh a year and I was like, yeah, 382 days. A, a Scottish man of over 400 pounds presents himself in the mid-60s to the ER department in Scotland and says, you know, I'm too fat. Um, I'm not going to eat for, until I get down to weight. And they're like, um, perhaps you shouldn't do that, sir. And he's like, well, I will. Can you keep, can you keep an eye on me? <laughs> and so, you know, they follow a man who's, who's clearly got, a, he's got plenty of stored energy, stored meals are on him. And he doesn't eat, he fasts therapeutically for 382 days and goes from 400 odd pounds to 180. Uh, whilst maintaining a stable, um, blood glucose. stable blood glucose throughout the whole time. So, you know, you don't have to um, <clears throat> consume glucose. And, I, and, I, you know, and then I asked these guys, has anyone not eaten for a day? And, you know, some kid down the back will put their hand up and go, oh, I did the 40 hour famine when I was a kid. And it, you know, it turns out they had two packets of barley sugars, you know, confectionery while over that 40 hours. Um, you know, most people just don't understand that it's quite plausible not to eat 
um, especially carbs, and you're going to be not just fine, um, but but quite well. Absolutely. Um, and that probably brings us into my next question. We talk about diabetes, and you'll often get a type 1 diabetic say to you, well, I need carbs or else I'll go into a hypo. Um, how, how would you, without, you know, treating somebody off, off the bat and, you know, saying you need to do this, but yeah. in a general sense, how would you frame it for a type 1 diabetic? Well, yeah, I mean, so type 1 <coughs> diabetics are, um, at, you know, one level sort of hard, but at another level it's quite easy. Um, so, you, you know, remember these are people who can't produce insulin from their pancreas, so um, they eat some amount of carbohydrate and you never know exactly how much you're eating. You don't know how fast exactly that's going to go into your body because it depends on what else you ate, um, you know, how much water you've been drinking, um, you know, the, probably the, the temperature, a whole bunch of things, how stressed out you are. Um, then that carbohydrate will go into your body as, blood, as glucose in the blood. Um, and then you'll try and inject some insulin to try and match the carbohydrate you've eaten to the, you know, to, to the insulin to that. Um, and again, you've got a problem. The insulin acts differently on cells every time, depending on, on, on how stressed out you are, how much um, you know, sun you've seen that day, how much sleep you've had, how, how, um, you know, if you've had any alcohol. Um, you know, basically, all the different things in modern life make you more or less insulin resistant. So you've got this matching problem of carbohydrates and insulin, and it's impossible not to miss. It's just not possible to get it right. Um, and so there's a few things you can do. And the first is to, um, if you have what the guidelines say, which is about 60 grams of carbohydrate, um, you'll miss. But the thing is, if you miss by giving yourself more insulin than you've had carbohydrate, then you send yourself into hypoglycemia, you start to feel faint, um, could be life-threatening, um, you know, especially if you're driving along on the, uh, in your car or you're out surfing or swimming or something. Um, so people tend to err the other way, so to not have quite as much insulin as they need, and they have run high blood glucose. And the problem there is that um, high blood sugars will take a couple of decades off your life. Mm. So you won't have hypoglycemia in the short term, but you know you reduce your lifespan, um, you'll suffer um, all the consequences of that from you know, retinopathy to you know to neuropathy, nerve problems in the um, limbs through to you know a whole bunch of other things, heart disease and so forth. So the solution to that is the law of if you had any carbohydrate, five or ten grams, um, you'll need much more amounts of insulin, um, and you'll still miss. But the proportion is uh, is the same, but the absolute missing is much smaller. So it's a little bit drive, like driving a car down um, a three lane highway, and when, you, when you've got a lot of carbohydrate, you've got a left and right button. And every time you push the right button, it, it just t you've got virtually no adjustment. It's either full right or full left. And you can imagine trying to keep the car on, a, on the middle line under those conditions. It's all over the place. And you can imagine on one side of the, the highway is a cliff, which is hypoglycemia. And the other side is a barrier, which is going to beat up your car, which will just take 20 years off the life of your car. You know, you're not going to want to go off the cliff, so you're going to just end up hitting the barrier um, and doing constant accumulating damage. Whereas if you're eating a low-carbohydrate diet and you're a type 1 diabetic, then that left and right adjustment is just a much finer adjustment. It's not going hard left and hard right. You've just got these little buttons that go hard left and hard right, uh, small left and small right. And after a while, you can control that uh, vehicle quite nicely and just travel a nice straight line. Um, and also, the next thing that's not really realized, when you're on a low-carbohydrate diet and you become fat-adapted, in other words, you can, your brain can use ketones as an alternative fuel source, even if you do low blood glucose, um, it's extensively not noticeable. So you replace glucose as a brain fuel with ketones. And we've seen in the literature that diabetics who do low carbohydrate diets can reduce their hypoglycemic episodes by about 80 odd percent so that you know that could be four or five a week um down to one or two a month and you know that's life-changing especially if you're for a child um you know imagine you're a parent of a type 1 diabetic 
um, little boy or little girl, um, and you know they, they run the risk of, of death overnight um, if their blood glucose drops so low that they um, go into a coma and that's the end of that. So, you know, I think um, properly managed uh, type one diabetic is, stands to benefit from this. Um, and in fact, I, I was just talking to a type one diabetic last week in Tauranga, um, and she's on a low carbohydrate diet. She's doing so well that HbA1c is um, just over 40, which is doing pretty well. Um, and she's been called back to see an endocrinologist because her blood sugar is too normal. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, she, you know, my endocrinologist has no idea what he's talking about. You know, and you go, <laughs> so the patient's just laughing at them. You know, it goes along anyway. <clears throat> You, you speak about um, fueling off ketones there, and and a good example of of that is what you mentioned the names before: Stephen Finney and, and Jeff Volick yeah. in different states with the with the Veritas study, and um, having great results in reversing type two diabetes. Do you think that we'll see a rollout of that Veritas study into type one diabetics? Yeah. So um, so v- v- Volick and Finney in the states have just started doing. A bunch more of this work, and they're you know the Verta company they're involved with. Is that that's what you're referring to, right? The one that's happening at the yeah. moment. Yeah. So I mean, first of all, they've, they've you know I, I was looking on their website today. They're very focused. So they use their their the point of the Verta, the company that's doing this, is reversing diabetes. So they they're firmly focused on that. They're not dealing with obesity. They're not dealing with anything else, and, and they're getting great results. Their initial results are you know what I'd expect, which are outstanding. Um, the interesting thing about that company um, is they capital raised 127 million off the bat. Um, it's an astonishing amount of investment in Silicon Valley and um, low carbohydrate diets. And it's very interesting if you sort of start to look through the, the trend in Silicon Valley at the moment, you know, Elon Musk's on his low carb diet and, you know, the ketogenic diet is very, very popular um, with that community, which is, you know, really an extensively an early adopter community that gets on trend. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, I think, uh, you know, Verta's ability to do that, um, their sort of emergence into the American healthcare system. Um, the fact that uh, Medicare in the U S have just changed the law. So they will now fund not just pharmaceuticals, but they'll fund effective behavior change programs for the first time. Um, I think Verta probably knew that and that's strategic. So I think, you know, there's hopefully a rapidly changing, um, space there. It's a space I want to get into next year a bit more as well. Um, where, you know, the problem for me, not just diabetes, but weight loss and, and dieting in general, especially um, the commercial programs, is a um, really no transparency in, in outcomes. You know, Weight Watchers, um, those sorts of things. You know, I'd like to start running those sorts of programs and be radically transparent about it. Um, you know, this is the number of people on through. These are the results. These are the defining characteristics of who's successful. Um, you know, and people can look and choose. Um, you know, different styles of of um, eating that will suit them. They can look at you know the the chances of success. You know, I, and in fact, that's a wider problem in medicine. Frankly, um, you know, you go to get a knee surgery. The first thing everyone should ask their knee surgeon is going, okay, mate, how many of these have you done? Um, how many have gone well? How many has, has nothing happened? And how many have got worse? Um, and, you know, overall, what's the, what, what are those ratios for this surgery in general? Um, you know, most people would never think to us that. They think it was rude. Um, it, it's, a, it's those numbers for every sort of medical treatment um, uh, to, in my mind, is a patient's right to know that, um, and you know, the more we ask about that, the better. And you know, if people ask that about statin drugs, especially for primary prevention, they probably wouldn't take them. I'm not saying that that they wouldn't, but because that's everyone's personal decision. But when you go, well, you know, you've got one and a, um, you know, for for every um, 250 odd people who take this drug, one heart attack will be prevented, but there'll be no change in overall mortality. In other words, you, you probably, it won't affect your chance of dying of stuff. Um, and if you're a woman, it'll make no difference whatsoever. You know, most people probably wouldn't choose that. Um, but we're not given those options. 
no, it's um, and if you take a placebo, you might have a twenty percent reduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, but you, you just can't know it's a placebo. That's the other thing. Yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, you you um, touched on fasting there with with a, a hundred day. Or, oh no, sorry, one year fast. Yeah. Um, am I correct that there's a new what the WTF coming out around fasting? Yeah. So we just we, we've got really into the. Um, I've become really interested in fasting. First of all, with my students because i'd give them an option of sort of open assignment of you know just try something on yourself um and see what happens and you know interesting to me a lot of them chose fasting um and had some good results we've done it you know i've done sorry but i think science is really sorry science has really exploded in the last couple of years yeah are you losing me yeah, I lost you there. I'll take take you back to you've you've done some done it for a while. I think you were. okay. So we've been I've I've been fasting my um, self for a number of years. I find it really useful for mood, um, for just managing my weight, my energy, um, especially my cognitive energy, especially when I'm writing. Um, you know, I actually I find I virtually can't write very well if I'm not fasted. So um, I'm just smarter when I'm when I'm fasted. At least I think I am. Um, <laughs> it's probably all that counts um, and there's been a real explosion in the research in fasting that's published research in the last few years um, notwithstanding the um, Nobel Prize in physiology um, last year was you know, around the biology of fasting so the, the notion of, of, of autophagy which is the cell's natural clean up uh, you know that's all that's become convincing so actually yeah you know, on that i think um most of us did you know biology at some time in secondary school and most of us remember that the um you know the diagram of the cell and you had the cell wall and you had the um the nucleus and the dna in, in the nucleus and you had the mitochondria around the cell and a bunch of other things floating around but the one that was always labeled that no one ever remembered what it was for was this thing called the lysosome um, and you know, we're now that's what the Nobel Prize for Physiology was awarded to the Japanese fellow um, last year was that discovery that under um, uh, low nutrient conditions, you know, i.e., fasting um, or sometimes ketogenic diets, um, the lysosome becomes active and starts scavenging up um, bits and pieces intracellularly and and you know recycles them um, for for fuel. And you know that's a healthy process, and when it's done inside, it goes uh, to the cell wall and starts to act extracellularly to other bits and pieces floating around um, in the cytoplasm. So that's uh, you know that process to so the process of autophagy plus that natural cell death apoptosis that cells um, under you know low nutrient conditions get recycled more effectively um, are the biology of fasting. And so, yeah, we started writing about that. We've got a new book coming out soon called What the Fast, um, you know, just to continue the WTF flavor, which, you know, well, at least I find that fun. So hopefully someone else does. They, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, I've, where I've settled for this is, you know, we've done all sorts of things. I've done the, the three and five day fasts, um, certainly haven't done the 382. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, for me, um, five's good. I know people have gone harder core and there's people who do two-week fasts and three-week fasts. Um, you know, I was just sitting down for um, dinner when I was over in the US a couple of weeks ago and a guy sits and he goes, yeah, I've done a 55-day fast. I'm just like, oh my God. Um, but, you know, you can do these periodic fasts of three to five days of, you know, really therapeutic. Um, yeah. And the evidence for immune cell regeneration is, is astonishing, really. Um, you know, you really start to kill off um, counterintuitively immune cells into the fast um, but they tend to be not very good ones that, um, and so you end up running your immune system down just slightly but when you refeed the immune system starts to repopulate and it does so plus some um, with new and more effective cells so that's that's good so I think that those are useful but but you can build in fasting um, more regularly you know so one or two days a week of a really compressed eating window, so I might just have one meal a day, um, a couple of days a week, and then keep that as a low carb meal. 
um, you know, that, that works very well for me and we've written quite a lot about that. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of people will hear that and go, yeah, I've been doing that for ages and, you know, that's crept into society in various places, but a lot of other people have never thought of it and um, find it bizarre, um, yet when they try it, they benefit so well, so much from it. Absolutely. Um, you spoke there about the refeed process. Um, I, I tweeted at you a, a, another article by Fadi and Volok um, yep. talking about that re, refeed. What's what's a good practice often you hear about people saying, you know, uh, bone broths and, and, and leafy, leafy vegetables and, and a soft cooked egg or something like that. How, what what have you sort of found? Is there any evidence? Yeah, those, those, are all, um, those are all good things and I'll do those sometimes. Um, yeah, my, my refeed thing is, you know, is, is generally a low carb, um, nutrient dense meal. So that's those sorts of things. Trouble with bone broth, you know, bone broth's great. Love it. Tastes good. Good for you. You actually got to be bothered cooking it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, like people do, and I'm not, I'm not poo pooing that. It's just, you know, life does get in the way. Um, and also sometimes actually, I just feel like something like some dark chocolate or something a little bit sweeter. Um, yep. and so I go with that as well so i don't mind either of those i think the mistake is where you just go oh yeah been haven't eaten for a you know day or a couple of days pizza bring it on or something you know it's just going to end badly um and you know alcohol definitely falls into that category um especially beer so you know those are the ones to be i mean it's, it's obvious isn't it be careful with that but you know you sort of yeah i think the other thing i've found after a longer fast especially a three or five day fast you sort of feel that the danger is you know, once you've had that sort of nutrient dense stuff and you've done it all properly, you sort of feel so you've got this sort of health halo floating around. So you're just like, oh, yeah, well, I can just eat whatever I want now. Um, <laughs> and, and that can go on for twice as long as the, as the fast sometimes. So, you know, that's definitely a, a trick to be careful with. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've had that experience, but, you know. No. Not first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, just while we're on bone, bone broth, um, Dave Shaw, I'm not sure if he's part of your lab as well, is he? Or? He's doing his PhD up where I am, but we're not supervising him, no. Yeah, um, he, he put up a, an article about being careful of heavy metals with, with bone broth. Have you got any comment around that? Uh, yeah, I guess it's possible. It depends what you're, what you're putting in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm not sure there's too much evidence for, for... I'm not aware of anyone suffering from, you know, harm from heavy metals from drinking bone broth. Um, it's plausible that you could. Yeah. Um, I guess if you chuck a whole shark in there and do a big fish broth, that could. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same as eating uh, too much tuna, uh, I guess. Yeah. Things, things like that. Um, and are you, are you going to, in the, in the book, What the Fast, do you touch on anything around, um, you know, Dom Diagostino is keen on, on fasting and how it might optimise the likes of, chemotherapy for for some treatments is there anything about yeah that's 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 such an interesting point i you know that's um so he's a real leader and a real legend in this um area and i think it's if, if i can commend you, anyone to a book even before um his staff is this uh Christoph, travis christopherson's um cancer is a metabolic disease um you know this is, this is basically a sort of history and physiology book of cancer that is just readable. Like you can believe it or not, you can just sit down and read it. Um, and you know, you, it's got all this, you know, just the history of cancer from the, from um, Otto Warburg who discovered the original Warburg effect, which we can talk about in a moment through to how they discovered. Oh no. <laughs> um, Italian port by the allies of, uh, yeah, through to uh, through, here, I'm just losing there. So through to a you know the the, the modern um, work with a fellow called Pete Peterson and his his um, PhD student Co who you know discovered a compound called three three bromopyruvate which you know was curing liver cancer. Um, there's a massive journey there. Um, that said, so you know first of all read that um, and you'll understand the the real basis of this Warburg effect, which is that, um, you know, cancer cells are metabolically very different from normal cells. Um, and how, if you can marginalize them metabolically by being in a ketogenic state or a fasted state, 
um, you know, the, the massive effects on that. Uh, and, you know, the, the latest animal research, I don't think the human research has properly been done yet, but it certainly will be. Um, and Degasino is doing some of that, um, which is, you know, if you're fasting um, or on a ketogenic diet while you're getting chemotherapy, then what's interesting there, I think, is that um, your cells become catabolic, your normal human cells. In other words, they get the signal to stop dividing and start that self-cleaning process that I talked about earlier, that, that autophagy and whatnot. And so if, if cells are doing that, um, cancer cells can't do that. They can't take that, that catabolic signal. They're constantly anabolic. They're always dividing rapidly. Um, and of course, chemotherapy um, is just basically poisoning cells, but the way the poison works is it gets the cells just as they divide. And so now you've got this protective effect. So the, your normal human cells are, aren't dividing, so are, are better protected. The cancer cells are still dividing, so they're marginalized to the chemotherapy. Um, and you know, the initial animal data is you know, really convincing um, that you know, survival is about twice as good and um, twice as long. So you know, that's um, with no real downsides. Um, this doesn't have to go through a drug trial, of course, because you're not taking anything. That's the whole point. Um, you're just doing normal chemo by not, and not eating, which is the exact opposite of, I think, what people have been told, haven't they? They go to oncologists and everyone's going, look, you're going to feel weak through the chemo. You're basically poisoning your whole body. Make sure you're you know, um, eating plenty of food. You know, Treat yourself, blah, blah, blah. Keep your energy levels up. Probably the worst thing you could do. Um, time will tell as the research comes out. But, yeah, it's really, really cool stuff. Yeah, I, I came across Dom Degas, you know, through listening to Tim, Tim Ferriss and anecdotally Tim talks about a friend that had chemotherapy and and just just the recovery rate each time they had therapy, you know, they were, they were back on board with, with normal life the next few days and, you know, again, something that's anecdotal and, and hard to hard to measure, but, you know, there's there's lots of things out there that this, this could be, could yeah. be what's, what's going to happen, eh? I, well, I think it's just going to become mainstream. Um, yeah. And, you know, you know, heaven forbid, if I or one of my family had um, did develop cancer, then I'd, you know, certainly be doing that as a start through my, you know, through my chemo. Yeah. And um, that, that book again by Christopherson, what was the title? Um, I think it's a metabolic theory of cancer. Metabolic theory. Well, a cancer is a metabolic disease, actually could be it. Um, yeah. But it's Travis Christopherson. Just go to Amazon. It's sitting right there. Great book. Fantastic. Um, and when can we expect What the Fast? Um, what the Fast is coming out for the 1st of May yeah. um, next year. So I've, I've finished, it, Karen and I have finished writing it. Um, it. It's just, you never quite figure this out with books. It takes a really long time. <laughs> and then print them. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a great process. Love doing it. Yeah. And um, Grant, if people want to, to find your stuff, what... Where can they find you? you you're, you've got the blog and, and the Facebook page. What are, what are they under? Yeah, so the blog is just profgrant.com and the book is whatthefatbook.com. Um, but if you just, you know, put in what the fat, um, not many other people use that term, so it'll pop up. <laughs> <laughs> can all find it. And um, before we head off, is there anything that you'd like to leave people with um, around thinking about, information or, or around nutrition or, or health information what would you like to leave people with do you think oh i guess there's one other thing i always want to say with nutrition I, like one thing that irks me in nutrition is people um for some reason put exercise and other things about well-being against nutrition like you know uh you know exercise is more important less important than eating um and you know that's the thing you know for, for most of us we want to live you know a long healthy life and you know have a, have a great time while we're doing it um, you know, nutrition is important, um, but so is so is moving about every day and exercising, and you know we shouldn't forget that. So is connecting with other people. You know, so is doing something meaningful in your life. Um, you know, so is you know being able to stay in the moment and all that sort of stuff. So you know, like if it's well-being you're after, you know, nutrition's certainly important, but you know, there's going to be a whole bunch of other things you have to fix, and they're different for everyone because we're all different. Um, you know, some people are very good at connecting with their friends and staying at the moment. Some of us find that really difficult. Some people are naturally optimistic and some people, you know, their glass is mostly empty. Um, 
So, you know, we can all benefit by a few tweaks that aren't just food. Food's important, but yeah, that's my... Absolutely. My take home. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Grant. And it's a, it's a pleasure to get you on, on the podcast and, and hear some of your gems out there because I, I definitely enjoyed your, your uh, two seminars you did with us at Snow Vision. And um, thanks very much for following that up with the article we wrote. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. Thanks very much. Cheers. Hey, so just, I've got a question for you. Yep. So what, what do you reckon the reception of that stuff is in the, um, in the eye health community, you know, the ophthalmology and optometry and stuff? Because it's quite a – had people – a lot of people heard that stuff before or was that new? And what's the response to it? Um, I definitely – you definitely stumped the room. <laughs> it's no vision, I noticed. Or that <laughs> I did notice people went more for the uh, small meats and, and eggs the next day as over the pastries. But um, – Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, I think I think it's it's a it's a work on without without ratting ratting um, my boss out. He's he's keen on a coke most days and and um, really yeah <laughs> you know it's, it's the odd thing you see in some medical practices. But there's yeah. there's um, another colleague of mine actually before before that lecture had told me about ketogenic and that was yeah. one of the one of the little seeds that I thought, well, what's he on about? I um, need, need to figure out a bit more about this. And, and then another colleague over in, in Sydney, I, I, sorry, in Melbourne, again, he's, his, he's lucky enough that his partner's a, a nutrition researcher and, again, someone yeah. looking into ketogenics. But um, I've had the odd bit of feedback from, from people in the industry, but I, I might just be uh, – too 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 low down to for anybody to know who I am at the moment to hear anything major, but yeah, um, it's yeah. with within my practice, there's a couple of people that that know about it. One South African knows yeah. Tim, Tim Noakes, um, another yeah. lad into uh, mountain biking and multi sport, and knows about ketogenic lifestyle. And uh, another one with an autistic son knows a little bit about ketogenic and low yeah. uh, low carb. So you know, there's there's conversations around and. Uh, Hopefully, uh, my, the article you wrote sparked a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, right. Because um, I just noticed in um, recent months, there's some, there's some, you know, there's definitely some people with alternative hypotheses about glaucoma as well. Now saying there's some, you know, but sugar, blue, you know, blood glucose stuff related to that possibly as well. And, yeah, um, it, it def, definitely with re reading this the stuff around ketogenics and um, Alzheimer's and then. Yeah all this work around glaucoma that is glaucoma a form of alzheimer's and, and can medical imaging of of the nerve fiber layer tell you about alzheimer's it, it definitely oh is that right is that right um so nothing nothing clinical yet but um yeah. it was it was definitely something that i put two two together that oh maybe these two are quite close because <laughs> that's because it, it's, it's such a highly um neurological and vascularized organ the ia so you know you'd expect that you know anything neural and anything vascular it's going to show up there that's right and you know yeah, it's glaucoma is one of those things that we've got a, a picture of it but we yeah. don't even, we don't even know that you know you've got to put enough parts together for it to be glaucoma and, and yeah. we we spend forever trying to diagnose it and, and then forever trying to treat it and the other person that gets treated nothing ever changes and and, and it's, it's it's complex, and and I wonder if this might be the missing the missing key. That is it metabolic. So, do, do you do, are people prepared to talk about their diet with with you, or you know, is it? That... Um, it's it's something I try to bring up. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not expecting it, eh? They're not really expecting to. No, and uh, often I get I eat healthy, but I yeah. Um, Go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they come in, that's right. What's what's out for you? Um, there's yeah, there's plenty of people out there that uh, are eating vegetables out of their garden and and whole foods and not eating bread anymore and staying away from pastas. So that you know, it, it's it's getting through in, in small populations. And then you know, I know, I, know yeah. I, was, I was like you said for years and years. I was a wheat bix for breakfast. To have a sandwich for lunch and eat some toast before I went to training and wondered why I keep getting gut cramps. <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, yeah. I, I was just doing a, um, some work with a, an elite teenage sports team yesterday. Um, only one of the kids was a, you know, wheat bix cereal. You know, the rest of them were actually, you know, 
on smoothies and eggs and everything, you'll be, I was actually surprised, you know, maybe that there is a bit of a change going on in some of those communities. Absolutely. And, uh, well, may the, uh, you working with education help. <laughs> You might have lost you again. Uh, just feel like quitting. Yeah, you're not, hard not to make it. That you sort of feel like quitting that job most of the time because you, you know it's just the government's so hopeless to change, and you know people want to work with them and want to do stuff, and you know it's just you know, you've, you've, you know the when I first started this, I, I, I did a sort of public statement where I said, oh, can we just stop fundraising by selling you know confectionery from schools? You know it's ridiculous that we're an arm of the food industry. Um, and the Minister of Health tweeted out that that was a ridiculous idea and he was definitely going to keep doing it. You know, so, you know, I tried to pick the one thing, you know, it's just like, okay, I'm new on this job, I'll pick something that everyone's going to agree on. You know, it's, it's fairly obvious it's wrong. Um, let's just do this. And Yeah, and you, you ended up on TV, you know, having to justify why you thought a lunchbox was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and the actual Minister of Health is a doctor, for God's sake, um, you know, specifically goes out of his way that day to actually uh, undermine that message, not support it. But, you know, people say, oh, we've got, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, for, uh, for our sake, uh, I hope that you, you managed to stay in the job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No. Uh, thanks very much, Grant, and I'll, I'll let yeah. you get back to your family. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Cheers. See you.